You're listening to Were You Still Talking? They pump out your blood and they pump in a, a new batch of blood and all of it is the blood of children. All the big stars are going to be on TV now. I mean, it's just the way it's going. Your role, I think, will be played by Brad Pitt. What would you wear? Uh, I wore my loincloth wrapped around my feet. Are you going by John today? And that's absolutely true. You feel it in every cell in your body. Yeah, you can, you can bend the truth and bend the visualizations no matter what your political affiliation. You could have an alpaca. My a, a girlfriend's daughter recently got married, and they had llamas or alpacas at the wedding. A recording room. They recorded uh, a couple songs in the kitchen of Rumbo. So, wait, you, you, you microdosed before this, right? What? Hey, welcome back. This is Joel Albrecht, and you are listening to Were You Still Talking? Today on the podcast, I have Suzanne Munson. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Munson. She, Mycin. I'm so sorry M- about that. M- Munson. Munson. Suzanne Munson. <laughs> she is a lover of history and author of books about America's founding fathers. Just published the metaphysical Thomas Jefferson, which is a very unique and interesting book. Previously wrote a biography about Jefferson's mentor, George Wythe, titled Jefferson's Godfather, The Man Behind the Man. Uh, I would like to read that book, too. That's next on my list. She lectures on the legacy of these two founding fathers at the college level and at various other venues. Following a career in corporate and nonprofit communications, she turned her attention to writing and teaching. Her interest in history began as a child, hearing of the trials of her ancestors in 17th century Jamestown, and settlements and the ex- Jamestown area settlements and exploits of her pioneer forebears a century later in Virginia's westernmost frontier. So, um, welcome, welcome to the show. Really nice to have you on. Thank you. So let's um, get a little bit more into. Let's explain to my uh, listeners a little bit more about the metaphysical Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it it says it right in the introduction. It kind of explains it, but. Um, Tell me the story of how this came about, because this is really interesting. I think it started with the death of my husband in 2013. And um, I wanted to know where he went. I wanted to know where we all go and what we do. Mm -hmm. And so I went on kind of a spiritual journey and um, tried to read what was recent research by uh, medical doctors and PhD researchers on afterlife studies. Uh, But my venture into uh, mediumship began at a writer's retreat. Uh, About six months after my husband died, there was a writer there who had written a book called Friends in High Places, which was kind of a cute title. And she uh, was an amateur medium and she did some ghost busting. So I said, well, hey, can you, do you think you can channel my late husband? And so she said, well, probably, you know, what's his name? So she went in her room and uh, had a yellow notepad and came back a half hour later and described him perfectly. And of course I told my children about all that and they were incredulous. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) so uh, then later that year, I went to a a meeting of the uh, IONS group that I belong to the Institute of Noetic Sciences. It's founded by astronaut Edgar Mitchell to bridge science with spirituality. I actually watch their videos on YouTube sometimes. Yes, Yes. it's an excellent organization. They Mm -hmm. do a lot of interesting studies. And so the speaker was a woman whose name is Irene Kendig, and her book was about seven readings by uh, a medium whose name is Jana Anna. And the book won uh, uh, many awards, national and international book awards. It's called Conversations with Jerry and others I thought who were dead. And so I thought, well, if um, if we can converse with normal people, why can't we talk with somebody famous? And although that thought came much later down the road, mm-hmm. but initially I uh, connected with this medium and with actually with a couple of others that just happened to run into. And uh, they brought my late husband in very clearly um, using words that only he would use and information that only he would impart about our children and our family. And so I, uh, I gained some confidence in this medium, uh, Jana Anna, 
she lives, I live in Virginia and she lives in Indiana. So we communicated by phone for an hour each time. Mm -hmm. So I uh, thought, well, again, if I can communicate with normal people, regular people, why not somebody famous? Why not Thomas Jefferson? Because I had already written about him in my first book, uh, which was a, a work of pure history with footnotes and bibliography and all those serious things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so the thought of channeling Jefferson through a medium occurred to me, a trusted medium, uh, somebody I thought could do the job. So I asked her if she had channeled any historic figures before. I'd, I gave her no advanced warning that I wanted Jefferson. And um, she said, yes, she had channeled uh, people from history before for writers, as a matter of fact, but I, I don't know who they were. But so so I, I set up an appointment. I always set up an appointment with her and uh, a week ahead of time. We have an hour. She calls me precisely on the dot for the uh, for my personal readings. I just use a yellow notepad and I would write furiously so that I uh, didn't have to go back and listen to an hour's worth of recordings, you know, two years later. Right, and, right. But for the Jefferson book, I had my laptop uh, ready to go, and I would put my speaker, my phone on speaker, and I would ask questions, which she would channel to the Jefferson entity, and then I would type furiously away. And um, then when I thought we had completed the answer to that question, we'd go on to another one. Mm -hmm. and, it's, uh, yeah. it's really fascinating. Did you... Have any like thoughts of using a medium before your late husband passed or had, did you have any interaction with mediums before that? Or is, did that come up afterwards? You really just wanted to know yeah. what, what he might, no, where he might I, be. I did not. I've always been interested in afterlife studies mm -hmm. uh, and particularly I would pay special attention to the near death experience stories that I would hear on TV sometimes. And then after he died, I really got into seriously into near death experience accounts okay. uh, that were being compiled by medical doctors and, and PhD researchers, very serious people. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot about the afterlife. And then I went on to read books by mediums and psychics and so on about what it was like on the other side. And I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I've been very interested in NDEs for a while now, and I'm I'm not sure why, but it's a, it's very fascinating, very fascinating. And yeah, a lot of the stories are from people who um, never would have believed it before they had an NDE. Like they're very, you know, scientific people and very skeptical. And so, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that because I know there'll be skeptics listening, but it's, uh, I'm, uh, it's very interesting to me. And I try and put away my skepticism and just listen to what people are saying and, and uh, you know, the book is full of insights and um, maybe you could explain it better. You actually say in the introduction about maybe if you don't believe this, read it anyway. Yes. Yeah. So I said, uh, it's either one of two things. It's, uh, it's a truthful account or it's a work of fiction. And you decide if you uh, can't believe that the process of mediumship works, then then just Read it anyway, because the material is very important. It's worth discussing. So I said there are basically three ways to look at the book. First, I wrote it. Secondly, the medium made it up entirely. Mm -hmm. And third, we're hearing from somebody presenting from the other side as Thomas Jefferson. And um, so I, I have eight hours of recordings that clearly show that I was the scribe and the one asking the questions. I wasn't providing the answers. I was typing the answers. And uh, the medium, Jana Anna, majored in elementary education. She hated history as a subject and knew very little about Thomas Jefferson. And she had some difficulty bringing certain ideas in. For example, she didn't know about Sally Hemings, the slave woman with mm -hmm. whom Jefferson was supposed to have had a relationship. She didn't know any of that story. And so when that came up, um, she was as interested in, uh, as I was with, with what was said. Yeah, that's really interesting. And did, so she, she's, a, she's aware of what's going on the whole time. It's not like um, she remembers all, all the stuff that she says. And 
the medium. She's, yeah, the medium. It's just flowing. It's just. Uh, it's just flowing. Like no, a, she doesn't yeah. remember after after the session is over. She doesn't remember, and she didn't want me to to say much about the the project in the beginning because she wanted to be fresh mm -hmm. and uh, just have a totally open mind channel to what was coming through. Right. Right. Yeah, that's really that's interesting. So she didn't you had to tell her all the stuff that she brought through later on. Or I mean did or did you give her the book to read or <laughs> did she Well, did she I, learn I, about it later? I only sent her the first chapter which explains the, the process. It, it talks mm -hmm. about um afterlife studies. And medium, mediumship is being studied at the university level now. Um, there are unusual um, brain frequencies in, 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 the, in the brains of, of mediums. And also the accuracy of their readings is being researched. Uh, but she didn't want me to send her anything other than just what I had said about her in the beginning, because she thought it might color some of her readings. So... Um, that I thought was was a good way to proceed. I did send her the book afterwards, and and she liked it. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. And what uh, you also had other people besides yourself asking questions. Is that right? You yes. Asked, who didn't know they were <laughs> asking questions of the the spirit of Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. The thought occurred to me that um, I should engage some. Jefferson scholars in mm -hmm. the process. But of course, I couldn't tell them what I was really up to, or they wouldn't participate. Oh, I and see. Yeah. So I went on um, Amazon and I found the living authors of some of the biggest best selling books about Jefferson today. And finally, found their emails. Some of them were attached to universities and so on. So I sent them a, a nice little friendly email saying that I had taught some Jefferson history at um, the university level and that I was thinking about a future class project and with the premise being if you could talk with Thomas Jefferson today what questions would you ask and so about eight of these um, historians were kind enough to reply and give me one or more questions and and I'm very glad that I did that because I wouldn't have thought of a lot of their questions. It, they asked really good ones. I had thought of some already, mm -hmm. but um, but they did provide some extra material that that was helpful. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's that's always good to have not only uh, different people asking, but people who are historians and are you know and know probably know more about them than than a lot of us do. So yeah, that's amazing. And then, did they? Did you send them the book, or at what point did they find out who they were? How, how these questions were being presented? Well, I did send them the book. It was it was my first draft of the book. Mm -hmm. I, I did some editing later, and um, I didn't expect them really to respond to it because it's strange. And I took their names out of the acknowledgments because I didn't want to embarrass them right, with a sure. project that they might not want to be associated with because um, many historians are, are, are materialists. Mm -hmm. They're very much in the material world as well. They should be if they're writing straight history, they, they need material matter for straight history. But I was writing something different. I'm, I'm writing metaphysical history, which is an entirely different process. So uh, I expect the book uh, to be panned by historians. There was one nice man who wrote back and said he had a question about one of the founding fathers that was described. And uh, I had the same question about that. So I, re I removed that paragraph. And, um, but uh, I, I write, I knew enough about Jefferson to each, each um, chapter begins with straight history. Here's Jefferson on slavery. Here's Jefferson on government. Right. Here's uh, Jefferson on religion. Mm -hmm. So I, I tr described briefly, to the best of my ability, what his views were on those subjects during his lifetime. And then we got into the questions from his place in spirit currently. 
Yeah, I love the the quotes at the beginning of the chapters. It's really interesting. It's it's very enlightening. And so none of the none of the historians were pleasantly surprised. None of them said, "Oh, that's that's great. That's a very interesting viewpoint." Or did they all just kind of uh, not care? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. They didn't really know how to respond, honestly. Okay. Sure. But I think um, it's if you go on Amazon, depending on what hour you you access Amazon, uh, you will find my book right up there with uh, Je other Jefferson books. So it it will get attention from historians. Now as to whether how they rate it, I don't know, but um, but a lot of people who have read it do think it's very important, and they think that it's adding to the conversation today about our government. Uh, my her purpose in writing in publishing the book, I started to say writing it, <laughs> in editing the book, publishing the book, uh, is to talk primarily to talk about America's government and how it's evolved since mm -hmm. the days of the founding fathers and, and some of our other institutions, such as the university that he founded, the University of Virginia. We talked about higher education. We talked about freedom of the press, what's happened to the media. And those are all issues that are very important to me. I didn't do this as just a fun exercise. Uh, I did it because there, there are lessons to be learned. There's, there are discussions to take place about what's happening in American government today, regardless of your political persuasion, whether you're left or right. Most everybody thinks that our government is a bit out of whack right now. And so Jefferson is, is an old revolutionary. He always called for a revolution every now and then. And so he's calling for a revolution today, but not of the, uh, of the bloody sort, he said, but a revolution of integrity. And he says integrity is greatly lacking now in our governing bodies. And again, this is regardless of polit political persuasion. Yeah, and I... I feel that way too. I mean, this is this is how I I throw my hands up sometimes and don't know how to react anymore to our government, um, especially in light of recent events. Um, the last four years were, in to my mind, a, an absolute nightmare. Uh, our government nearly fell apart just a few months ago. I don't under I don't know if people don't understand that or if they just don't believe that. Like somewhere in their mind, it's easier just not to believe that that, that happened. Um, but I also think our government mostly fell apart 20 years ago because w they took away a lot of corporate limitations and they added a lot of government, um, you know, abilities to basically run corruptly 20 years ago. This didn't just happen. Um, it happened fairly openly in plain sight. And so it, it worries me because... I'm not sure where we go from here. Like, is from what I see, and he, he it sounded like Jeff, it seems like Jefferson said that in the book. It, it's a non-functioning government at this point. And um, did you get? Were there parts of the? I mean, were there things you found out that were that seemed like they could help with that, or that that made it? I don't know that put some light on the subject because all it just doesn't seem like this experiment is working very well now. And you know, the idea that we're supposed to go back and revisit that constitution seems to be very difficult to get through to anybody. Yes. Well, I knew that I had to end the book on a more or less positive note. I couldn't just have it all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. So after he would have all these dark, comments about our government, uh, about the, the greed, the corruption, the um, power mongering that has been going on for quite a, quite a while. It's not just a current problem. Um, you know, our Congress was totally corrupt back in the 1890s, I think. So right. It's been, yes, been true. Like a long time. Yeah. So, um, so I asked him, I said, can't you say anything positive? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> Um, do you see any hope? And he said that, um, I said, what would you do if you were president or a member of Congress? I sort of put him on the spot on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, if he were president, if he were to come in as president, um, 
this year, next year, he, he could do very little because there'd be too much opposition to the reforms that he would want to make. He said he would come in first as a member of Congress. And he said that uh, if he came in now, there would be very little he could do because again, there would be opposition to the reforms. Uh, definitely he wants to get big money out of politics. Definitely he wants people to, candidates to go back to handshaking and getting close to the people and hearing what the people say, rather than just buying slick ads on TV and what you get in the mailbox. Um, and uh, yes, he's, he's very much afraid of what big money has done to politics. Uh, also what it's done to the media, that the media has been bought out. But he said that uh, if he were in Congress, uh, there are some in Congress now, some of the newcomers, uh, and maybe some of the older people, but probably more newcomers who come in with the idea of really serving the people rather than special interests and being good public servants. And he said that he tries to whisper in their ears, but he said, if you were to walk the halls that he considered sacred, mm -hmm. you would be uh, quite alarmed by the confusion that's going on now. And by now, I mean recent years. And um, so he said that he would surround himself, try to begin surrounding himself with a circle of integrity, that um, he would, would start with a small group and then that group would enlarge. And as the group enlarged, it, they, they would be capable of achieving some reforms. I asked him about term, term limits and he said, theoretically he was opposed to term limits because if you have a really good person, that person should be allowed to serve as long as he or she is serving the people. But with the way things are now, he would have to support term limits because the power and money are corrupting too many individuals in Washington. Yeah, that's a term limits is a tough one for me because we have two uh, really good people in the um, federal government from Oregon who have been working very hard for a long, long time. Uh, I don't know how they keep up the fight because they seem like they seem very different than most of the people in Washington. Um, you know, their name comes up often in the national news because they're doing stuff that no one else will, will try. And so I would hate to see them go. Like, I don't know who would replace them, but, um, there's another side of that, that yeah, people keep doing the same thing. Uh, keep doing corrupt stuff and can basically do it forever. So a big, yeah, to me, a big part of that is, again, goes back to the money in politics. Um, it was my dad actually taught me the theory that there should be, they, it shouldn't cost money to run for office. You know, that should all be uh, paid for and there should be t time set aside for advertising. This, so it's the same for everybody. But yeah, at this point, if you don't have the money, if you don't have the backers, who knows how many really good people are out there who could, you know, be in, who would be interested in government, but they have no, they really have no chance because of how it's, how it is today. It's, yes. It's pretty tough. Well, I, I give a talk on America's first leadership crisis, which occurred in 1776. This came from my first book about Jefferson's mentor, um, George Wythe. And at the end of the talk, I say, um, you know, democracy is not a spectator sport. And um, if you're not uh, aware of what's going on in your precinct, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're not showing up at the precinct level, if you're not voting in the primaries, if you're just waiting till November to vote, then you're really not, you're not being a good citizen, you know? And I, I think Jefferson, he did say in the, in, our interviews that that a lot of lethargy um, had taken place here in America, that people were getting very lazy about the political process, about being informed. And also he was very concerned about the misinformation that people are getting. One thing he did say that was interesting, he, I asked him about the media being complicit. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, that there were still some investigative reporters who would, I think, what was the term he used? get to the root ball of the disease or something like that. He uh -huh. used a lot of natural terms mm -hmm. uh, who, who would root out corruption and so on, but that by and large, the media had been 
bought out by corporations and special interests. And then, um, and I, I want to talk about his use of modern terminology and his knowledge of what's happening today. Mm -hmm. We talked about the internet and he said the, the powers, the controlling powers envisioned that they could also control the internet as they were trying to control certain newspapers and TV channels, and radio programs and so on. Um, but the internet had sort of gotten out of, out of control and uh, out of their control. I mean, it is out of control, but it's out of their control. <laughs> it's definitely out of control. Yeah. I, I t- yeah. <laughs> I'm they aware that even it. though I, I use the internet for this very podcast, but it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely out of control. And yeah. 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 That they can't, that freedom, that truth will eventually out. Mm-hmm. That truth will always find a way, ultimately. And that was that is his hope. But the um, one thing I have to say in the beginning of the book is that I was very surprised that his words, as they were translated by as accurately as she possibly could by the medium, uh, his some of his words were very modern. Some of his concepts were very modern. He used the word ego quite a lot. Mm-hmm. He knows about the internet. He knows what's going on at University of Virginia and in the higher education. And um, he knows what's going on with our foreign policy and our military. We talked about those things. And so I, we've always been, we've had very vague ideas about what awaits us after we depart our bodies, after we drop our bodies and go on someplace else. You know, where do we go and what do we do? That's one thing I wanted to know more about. And so I always thought we just, most of us have this idea that we sit on a pink cloud and play a harp, you know, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. what do we do? And so I, I, that's one of the things I wanted to find out about in my journey. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was told that his Jefferson's soul, his essence, his mind is far greater than one century. Um, that it's universal and that he does keep up uh, very much. He walks the walls of Congress. He says he whispers in the ears of the good ones. And um, I had this, I've always had an affinity for Jefferson being a Virginian and, and living not too far from Charlottesville and having two children who went to UVA. And um, so I've, for some reason, I've had this fantasy or used to have it, don't have it anymore, about resurrecting Jefferson from his 1826 resting place, putting him in my car and showing him around the University of Virginia. And I would tell him I would be the one in charge and I would be driving and I would be telling him, you know, look at the women here. Look at the people of color here. Look at the people from China. And aren't you excited about this? But the thing is, he, he already knows all that. He's been following what's been happening since his death in 1826. And he's very current about our current events. And when that makes sense to me, having listened to a, a lot of the um, NDE account, that it sounds like time doesn't work the same way in the afterlife. Um, I definitely, I'm definitely a believer that we don't, we don't end at death, that that's not the end. I'm not a materialist in that way. And, um, I think it was Deepak Chopra that said recently, maybe he said it many times, that what the what people see in this NDE experience is really the the beginning, you know, of what's going to happen to them. So they come back having not really, maybe not see, being seeing the whole picture. So it, yes. it, com- it completely makes sense to me that that the spirit of Jefferson would, you know, would be up to date and possibly jumping around in time, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he can go anywhere in time that he, he wants. And it, it's, um, it also makes sense that he would be able to speak to you through a medium. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Other people might be skeptical. I'm really not that skeptical about it. It's very interesting. Uh, and the things he had to say are also very interesting. Um, definitely the, um, yeah, the whole thing with the media. Oh, there was an interesting story that I was reminded of. We were talking, you were talking about the internet the power of the internet and how they haven't been able to get their hands around it. Basically corporate, the corporate powers are still not in control. And there was a beautiful illustration of that recently where many of these 
young influencers, I think they were all on YouTube, but they may have been on different mediums, were approached by a marketing company to spread conspiracy theory. And instead of taking the money and spreading the conspiracy theory, they told that story. <laughs> they said, this company approached us to, you know, basically to tell you lies. And it, it was very interesting. I was like, way yes. to go, way to backfire. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are taught, most religions tell us that we are eternal beings, that there is life eternal. I know the Christian mm -hmm. faith is that. Uh, but um, Jesus was pretty vague about the specifics. All he said was, I go to prepare a place for you, and in my Father's house are many mansions. That's about it. And um, I thought, well, what kind of mansions? Is it Spanish or colonial or what? <laughs> <laughs> What's the architecture like? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and, and there are uh, people now who do have some access to the other side. Mm -hmm. um, they have gifts. I, I do not have that gift. I don't have any gift whatsoever. I have what knowledge I have, I get through reading and I try to go to scientific resources as, as much as I can. But I, I, I do believe that some mediums have a gift. And in, in our generation, we were taught in the 20th century, we were taught basically that they were all charlatans that they were taking advantage of gullible people. And that's still the mindset that a lot of people have of mediums. But the modern, the more modern view, the 21st century view, and if anybody watches that cute little lady from Long Island, the Long Island medium. Oh, right. On TV, right. Uh, well, you know, she's got a good heart. She's just trying to help people. And, um, and, and most mediums do have good hearts. They are, there's, there's a lot of unfinished business when people die. Oh, I wish I told my mother that I loved her. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I didn't go to my father's funeral, whatever. And, um, and a medium can, can make those connections and can bring about healing. And, and I see that the medium that I uh, use does a lot of that. She, she's a healer and a facilitator, and she has a good heart. And the only reason Jefferson said he was going to participate with me on this project, I asked him if, if we had a book to do together. And he said he thought that I was coming from a good place, from my heart, rather than, you know, I, I did, I've not written it to make money or to be famous myself, but to get the word out, some important words out to the public about what we need to be thinking about with regard to our government and our other institutions. Not just the government, but the way we're using the military, the way higher education has evolved, it's overpriced, it's top heavy. He talks about all those things. Oh, that's great that he gets into those these other subjects because yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot more to it than, than just the government and this this push to spend all your money on college is not necessarily the best thing for everyone either. I mean, just the whole educational sim symptom system <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> seems to have also evolved into a money maker, even though I know lots of people who work at universities and the university never has any money. So it, it's tough. That's a, it's a really, it's a tough one. Cause yeah, when, uh, when people my age went to school, it was, it still seemed expensive, but it was nothing like it is today. Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. You could pay off your student loans, you know, it was doable. But now, yeah, I, I hear about people having student loan debt for their entire life. And that, that makes, that's just terrible. It makes no sense. Um, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is the, the country you live in. Because if you live in Canada, that's not going to happen. You know, you can go to college. Uh, I think you do have to um, qualify, but they'll let just about anyone into college and you don't have to pay. You don't, mm. it's, yeah. it's like, you know, education is so important. And I, th I mean, you know, that goes back to the money in politics and the, and the way the media has been taken over. Education doesn't help that, right? If you have educated populace, uh, that stuff doesn't work as well. So, you know, yeah. then people start voting and doing things mm -hmm. like this. And that, I mean, that's a big reason I think that people don't vote is that a lot of people are working all the time. So they have no time to study what their candidates are doing. A lot of people, more and more people every year are living below the poverty line. So voting is the last thing they're thinking about. 
And then they're getting their information from what you're talking about, corporate media that is not necessarily honest. And even when they're trying to be honest, they can't always be because they're sponsors and they are telling them what they can say and what they can't say and their producers and all the higher up. So it's very difficult. I know it's difficult for the people in media who are trying to do a good job, you know, and trying to, to tell the truth and things like this. It's very hard to, to do that now in the current, the current atmosphere. It's yes. really tough. Jefferson yeah. was one of the first um, of the founding fathers to promote universal education uh, mm -hmm. for the people, for average people. And in his day, only the elite were educated and only the men, the boys were educated uh, generally. And um, so, yes, he was a big proponent, not, not only of a good um, university education, but a good general education for, for the average uh, person and paid the education paid for with tax dollars. And of course the powers that be in Virginia didn't want to use any of their dollars to educate the unwashed but um, Jefferson famously said, only the educated are free. Only educated people can be free. The others can be manipulated. And so he sees, you know, as, as you do, a lot of manipulation today. Because one thing he said, he said, one thing he really craves on this planet, he said, is critical thinking. He said, people will just... Um, accept whatever they hear or see and not run it through their minds um, and believe it. And there's such a lack of critical thinking now. And uh, theoretically, you should learn critical thinking in school. And um, that's part of what a university training should be like. He says, right now, a lot of colleges are just training people for jobs, and that's fine. But they they should be training leaders as well. They should be training critical thinkers. Yeah, I only recently realized that um, they no longer teach, um, now I forget what it's called, but they no longer teach, oh, um, what is the word for it? They don't teach the, the way our government works anymore. Civics. Civics. They don't teach civics. Well, it's obvious. And it's obvious, but it, that just, I didn't realize that. I just, that's become, it became a headline at some point. And I was like, how could they not teach civics this is a basic thing and now they're trying they're um even in our state they're trying to let people go without actually knowing how to read or do math and um this is those are the kind of things that teach critical thinking you know this is yes, this is where exactly. you start maybe you don't maybe you don't think that's important but actually that's what that's kind of where critical mm -hmm. thinking stems from i think that's very important too it um a lot of people are down on education for all kinds of different reasons but if you could just if you could just teach people to you know to think to learn how to learn yes. that's a that's a big one that's a, a really big one that yeah it's get, it's there's so much emphasis on getting diplomas that that seems to be less and less important to people yes it's all about employment right and um yes um Another thing that uh, came out in the book, this was a, um, a question by uh, one of the historians. I wouldn't, I don't think I would have thought of this, but uh, one of the historians said, who is the most influential person in your life? And um, I would have said George Wythe because I wrote a book that George Wythe was his most important mentor and, and um, got him started as a statesman and, um, could have been a fox hunter. He could have just been a gen gentleman farmer. Mm -hmm. he, he, mm -hmm. could, he was kind of headed that way as a teenager, an unsupervised college student. He was hanging out with the wrong people. Anyway, he didn't say George with. He said, um, he said, so I said, who is the most influential person in your life? And the question, the answer was, other than my mother. I thought that was strange <laughs> because, uh, the common perception is that he and his mother were not close mm -hmm. that um, because he never wrote about her and he was a prolific writer. He wrote about every, everybody and everything else in the world, but he never mentioned her except her death and passing. So, uh, and there was a book written about um, 
presidential mothers. And most of the presidents were mothers' boys, believe it or not. They had, the fathers were weaker. Some were alcoholics and mothers kind of raised many of these men. Um, and so the author of that book said, well, there were two, Washington and Jefferson, who didn't seem to be too close to their mothers. And, and she was just making an assumption there. Anyway, so Jefferson said that his mother had been very important in his growing up, that the great gift that she gave him was listening. That whenever he had something to say, and of course he was a genius, I guess the genius showed, it, showed itself as a, as a boy as well as as an adult. Mm -hmm. But um, she said, he said that whenever he, he had something to say, she would drop what she was doing and she would lock eyes with him and she would give him her full attention. And he said, you have no idea how important that is to a child to be listened to. And um, he said his mother had her problems that if she were alive today, she would be treated with therapy and drugs. Uh, I think she might have had some mental unbalance. I don't know. But, um, but I thought that was interesting that he did. The first person in his mind was his mother as a great influencer. Yeah, that's, um, that's actually a beautiful thought that she would stop and, and listen like that because ha it happens so seldom. It's, you know, it's something that people seldom do. So to have your mom do that, the most impor important person in your life. And I wonder if he just, maybe she was too, he was too close to her to write about her and to, you know, share her with other people. That maybe be. that was part of it. And if she yeah. had some problems, maybe they didn't want to talk about those. Right. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. You definitely, people don't want to talk about that now, but yeah. you definitely do want to talk about it in the 1700s. That's so right. is there... Um, uh, a favorite like insight that you got from the book or a favorite part of the book for you that you, something you learned? Well, um, it was all interesting. Uh, I did ask him about religion and mm -hmm. spirituality. And um, in his day, people thought that he was a deist. They didn't think that he was a Christian because he was very skeptical about organized religion. He had been in Europe. He had been in France. He'd seen uh, religion not quite at its worst. It was probably at its worst in the Renaissance, Italy. But um, still, there was um, a, a lot to, to be criticized about re organized religion that he mm -hmm. saw in Europe. And um, he didn't want that to happen, to take place, that to take root in America. And so the first America's first religious freedom law was written by him in conjunction with his mentor, George Wythe, who doesn't get any credit for it, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. But um, that was one of his three of Jefferson's three proudest achievements that he listed on his tombstone. The first was author of the Declaration of Independence. The second was the statute of Re Virginia statute for religious freedom. And the third was father of the University of Virginia. Now, the first religious freedom law passed in Virginia in 1786 was several years later incorporated in the First Amendment in the Constitution. It made a direct path to the Constitution. So I talked, I asked him about religion, and he said he's still um, oh, very skeptical about organized religion. He says that uh, Jesus has withdrawn his energy. From many churches today because they've gone off the path they're judgmental they're more about power money and judgment than they are about teaching the doctrines of love and forgiveness and service to mankind so i asked him about what's known as the jefferson book jefferson bible oh yes Yes. The Life and Teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, I think, is the full name of it. And um, this was a, a, a project of his later years. He took several translations of the Bible, ancient and modern, and he basically did a cut-and-paste job. <laughs> and um, he took out things that he thought were supernatural, like some of the, the miracles and things like that, um, 
things that might have been based on his view of ignorance. And he just stuck to the basic uh, life and teachings of Jesus. And so he had the book beautifully bound in Moroccan leather, and it was it was a work of love. And that book was discovered some years ago and uh, was published in the um, 20th century. You can get it on Amazon. And um, I have a copy. And for years, the Jefferson Bible was given to new members of Congress. Uh, not anymore. They, they can get it if they want it. But um, so he said, so I said, well, um, are you pleased with your work on, on what's known as the Jefferson Bible? And he said, yes, he was very happy with that, with what, what, with what he had done with that, that he had tried to bring out the, the true teachings of Jesus. And um, he said that the Christ energy is, is viable, it's true, it's, it's real energy in this world that Jesus can be accessed and his name has power, but that um, he has withdrawn his energy from many churches. I think we all know some churches who still um, preach love and forgiveness and compassion and helping the poor and all that. There are some around, but mm -hmm. there are others that, that uh, have strayed from the path. And he's uh, sad about that, but that's just the way things are. Yeah, that's, that's very unfortunate. Um, that 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 uh, discussion could be a, a whole nother hour. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's, a lot, mm. there's a lot to it. A lot to it. I mean, I always yeah, because everyone in everyone in government, it seems like, has to say that they are Christian, and most of you know, and that as long as they're not Catholic or Jewish, uh, there seems to be a very strict um, protocol for what you need to be to be elected. So I'm always very skeptical about how much people follow that, those doctrines or not, you know, it's, it seems like most of them do not. Um, but yeah, the Jefferson Bible you should probably read that. I am not yes. a Christian myself, but I, I have, uh, I follow a, a minister who's non-denominational and talks a lot about the, the Christ consciousness. You know, and, and, yes, that's what it's. Yeah. A lot of people are calling it now the Christ consciousness, yeah, which is a whole different realm of thinking. But, right, right. Um, yeah, but before we go on any further, I, I would like to give the title of my book for anybody who'd be interested in buying it. Um, the title is "The Metaphysical Thomas Jefferson," and um, the rest of the, the the front page says the rest of the cover says. Uh, a medium channels the founding father. I had to put on the cover what it was about. This is not just another Jefferson biography or not another book about Jefferson. This is a medium channeling the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, if you choose to believe that. Uh, and I, I, I didn't have that in the title when I sent the, my first draft to the historians. Mm -hmm. And I think they were a little puzzled when they got into it and, and saw what it was. So, so people know what they're getting into when they buy the book, clearly. And um, so I, what I recommend is people buy it and send a copy to your congressperson. Um, pe people in Washington need to read this book. They really do. And um, there's, there's some important lessons in the book about things that need to be changed and thought about. So um, I've given a copy to my congresswoman. Mm -hmm. I happen to think she's one of the good ones and she's fairly new, uh, but she's really trying hard to be bipartisan and to serve the people. And uh, I don't see how she does it. She's a young mother. She's a superwoman, but I've given her a copy of the book. I haven't heard back from her yet because she's busy, but I hope she'll have time to read it. Well, that's wonderful. That's a really good idea. And uh, th thanks for making sure that I got that out there. We, because sometimes I forget. Uh, also, the first book you wrote uh, sounds like a really good book. And what's that? What, what's that called? That's called the Jefferson's one. Godfather, mm -hmm. the man behind the man. Or you can just, um, if you go on Amazon, just key in Jefferson's Godfather, 
And um, my last, my name is Suzanne Munson, M-U-N-S-O-N. If you type my name in, you'll get the two books on Amazon. And um, so the first book is, is straight history, uh, no channeling. Although I actually, after I wrote the book, I did a, a little bit of channeling with those two people. And, uh, but I couldn't include any of that in the book. Maybe mm -hmm. a little bit, but just what was what you could prove is is coming from them. But that was straight history, and um, and that's about the early years of, of of this nation and how we lacked leaders. You could there were very few men of the caliber of our founding fathers. Most people were uneducated and poorly motivated, and we didn't have a democratic republic in 1776. Nobody knew how to operate within that form of government. All they had known was rule by kings and queens and nobility. So this is the story of how our government got started and got started on the right foot by a teacher who taught future leaders not only to lead, but to lead ethically. And so uh, Jefferson, I think, got his great sense of ethics from this man, George Wythe. It's George Wythe's biography. Jefferson's godfather, the man behind the man. And uh, because as, as a college student, Jefferson was, in his own words, heading in the wrong direction until mm -hmm. he uh, got these adult, really excellent adult mentors, much older than himself, who uh, led him on a different path. Well, the, they, they both sound like wonderful books because um, that sounds very interesting both books. And I've always, I get very frustrated and I hear people say democracy doesn't work. Look what's happening here. And I try and rem remind people who say that this is not democracy. And um, it would be great to see if democracy works because I don't think we have it yet. Uh, it's hard to, I often have to remind myself that 200 years or a little over now is a very short time. And it's a very short amount of time to try to make something this big of a change work. Uh, it might have worked better at some points than it, than at others, but it's still something that's definitely worth working on. I hope we keep working on it. I hope people do uh, do what you suggested. Buy your book. Uh, all of it will be in the show notes. There'll be links to the book, uh, both books, and uh, more history um, and all that kind of stuff. So I actually have to wrap it up now because unusual for me, I have something else scheduled. Usually I don't have much scheduled, but today I do. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's, it's been fantastic. Um, I really appreciate the, the book, and it's a very interesting way to, uh, to write a book. And so, um, yeah, I hope people go in and check it out. So you've been listening to Were You Still Talking? This is Joel Albrecht, and I've been talking to Suzanne Munson. And we have been talking about the metaphysical Thomas Jefferson, which is uh, a very different way to talk to Thomas Jefferson. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Feel free to share it. Share it with all your friends. Many more people need to hear about this. And I uh, hope you come back soon. And as I always say, be good to each other. And be good to yourself. And that's it. Okay.